Thank you, Paul. You helped me with the first two slides. Welcome, everybody. As Paul said, the first half of this, the first half hour is tutorial. Some of you sat into our Cloud 101 last year. Uh, it'll be a minor refresher on that, followed by some examples of some work we did with SEMPTI and uh, PBS and a paper presented uh, at the PBS work for Tech Forum earlier this year. The expert panel, we have SHI, Cisco, and Globecom up on panel talking about real life applications and some of the uh, configurations that we're working on what file-based workflow and OTT on a private cloud configuration and what we're doing on the enterprise side as well. So just uh, quickly on the tutorial side, the definition of cloud computing, we talk about it not being doing stuff in the cloud. We're talking about the use of a new generation of technology that started with virtualization and provides a wealth of flexibility for system designers, architects, and implementing a variety of different applications. This is the NIST definition that the industry is starting to use, and we, we use it, and so do our partners. It's basically the definition of a pool of resources, memory, servers, um, uh, storage, security, a variety of tools at a resource level, user being able to configure it on demand without any manual uh, help and it's a shared pool so you can adapt to uh, changing dynamic load conditions and to meet uh, performance uh, high quality of service requirements. The uh, NIST definition comes with a number of uh, sub-levels. We talk about four deployment models all the way from public uh, to private cloud. We talk about three service models, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service. And finally, it is all built on this resource pool that is virtualized. We're talking about having broad network access, having rapid elasticity to be able to accommodate demand and flexing, uh, flexing uh, workload conditions, measuring the service you can build, on, build per SIP, and on demand, as I mentioned earlier. We're going to go into each of those, and if you look at the upper left-hand corner, there's a little roadmap to where you are on that, that chart. There are these terms. If you look at Amazon Web Service, that's a public cloud. You can put down your credit card, and you can then demand the service. You look at the other extreme is private cloud, which will either have one tenant or multiple tenants, but it's not a credit card application. It's a private cloud, restricted users, a different billing system, but it's all the basic core technologies that you see in the public cloud, but it's more secure. And that's the focus we're going to be talking about for media and entertainment. Hybrid cloud is a mix of public and private. And the community can be public, private, or otherwise, but it's a group of users who want to focus on some. For example, airports might have a private community cloud, and they're sharing some common capabilities. In our case, we're talking about station groups, for example, might be a public, uh, private community cloud application. You look at that Bach diagram-wise, you look at the public cloud, it's out there. A private cloud is on-premises or hosted or managed and is specific to a specific user and a hybrid combines both aspects of those. You look at the three service models we talked about and there's a, and you, there's a plethora of different things. You can see video service as a service. Everybody's got a little XAAS these days. Uh, the traditional IT sense, and we heard Verizon or Viacom earlier today talk about moving from dedicated hardware platforms to a rack of equipment that is future-proof. Well, the state of the art today in IT merging in with, with broadcasting applications in traditional sense, we're talking about all this, the basic building blocks from servers and storage all the way up to virtualization. That's a traditional stack. When you start providing the basic virtualization and below, the resource pooled, so you can buy so many computers for two hours, one hour, 10 weeks or a steady base and peak, peak demands, that's infrastructure as a service, and you as a user would provide the next level of value added. If you're buying a service, which includes the next level up of value added, for example, transcoding uh, as, a, as an opportunity or um, file-based workflow, media asset management, that would be platform as a service, writing on top of infrastructure as a service. And if you get right down to having that app on your iPad or on your laptop, that's now software as a service, and it's the next level up. And a very famous example is Salesforce.com as a soft, software as a service. When Salesforce.com got very popular, they started offering all the basic building blocks, social networking, database management, as platform as a service, so you could build your own software as a service on top of that. So these are the basic building blocks. SHI on our panel today 
we'll be talking about what they have as an offer of infrastructure as a service, and that can either be a private uh, cloud infrastructure as a service, a managed or a hosted one, and you see all the different configurations of them. When we start layering on top of that an application like Cisco's Videoscape, you also suddenly have the next level of value added, and then you can actually go on top of that right to the, to the device level. And Peter Chave here from Cisco will be talking later about adaptive bitrate uh, coding, for example, and how that all fits together. The third element of the NIST definition of cloud computing are these five major characteristics that we've talked about. Everything below here in the little blue box existed before cloud computing existed. Cloud computing was never defined as a term until about 2006, 2007, when Amazon when, uh, launched the uh, Amazon Elastic Cloud service. And it was the first time you started using that term in the industry. And up to that point, virtualization's coming along steadily, people going from single servers to single, multiple applications on, on servers. And the reason the IT developed along the old route of what they call server creep, I've got an email server, I've got an FTP server, I've got a, a uh, transcoding server over here, or whatever, is they didn't trust them all to run on the same machines. They all had different compatibility issues, so it was way easier to just stack up servers all over and add them along, and double it up for redundancy, and away you go. Along comes virtualization, and it allows you to run multiple applications, multiple operating systems, all on a stateless compute layer of CPUs and multiple cores. That's why the multi-core development has come along so fast over the last few years. And below that, a logically configurable network of memory and networking. So that's, so that's the basic build. That's, this existed before. What's made it magic for cloud computing and why it's been enabled and why people like SHI can suddenly build a private cloud in this building and run all our operations off it is something called a provisioning layer. A single pane of glass, I can drag and drop firewalls, DMZs, servers doing this, doing that. I can create virtual machines, rebuild it. All of a sudden, the Olympics coming on. I've got to load for the next two months. And, or this example Viacom did this morning about I've got to get this out for uh, Netflix. You can build it all up, configure it, run it. When it's done, tear it all down. And you only paid for what you use. So that's the basic concept behind cloud computing. And we tie that in with the broad network access and uh, that's coming along now. Uh, all the rapid elasticity you get, and away you go. One of the advantages of this system is it's self-healing. So we don't talk about one-for-one one redundancy in, anymore. We talk about N plus one. I don't need a complete double server bank. What happens now if something fails, it automatically self-heals. And once a month, you drive the truck around and you replace hard drives and CPUs without ever turning anything off. It's just the way it does. Data is triplicated, typically. You don't lose your data. So this is uh, sort of the building blocks and building it up from there. One of these aspects, there are several of them. One of them is the scalability of the cloud. We heard Viacom this morning talk about it's important to be able to scale for the kinds of immediate things. These Netflix, he gave his example. We have uh, 10 days to get out this program to Netflix. That would be an example of a load. If you look at companies that are starting up today, they don't build their own server farms anymore. They start in the cloud. You look at Foursquare. You look at Zynga, the game on, on, on Facebook. A um, number of, of these guys. Uh, I'll show you in a few moments. So this little curve here, this demand and capacity curve, could either be a company that's starting up. You know, you're building up. This is what you would normally, sales forecast is always perfect, right? We all know that. So the IT guys come along and they say, I'm going to build you this much capacity and I'll put in some more CapEx and I'll build it up and away you go. So what happens, and it, of course it's always perfect, but what happens in reality is the actual demand fluctuates. And then if you've got a really good um, product, you've got a good service, all of a sudden it takes off and takes on going like, the advantage of cloud computing, because you have that virtual pool, and allows you to come in on demand and, and, the, and um, as you required, you can set trigger points. So you automatically scale up and down as you go. And the advantage of it is you pay per SIP. And uh, again, SHI later in the panel will talk a bit about their unique business model, about how you have a standby capability, and then as you go. In the broadcast arena, imagine again, you suddenly have a tremendous a workflow, you're grabbing linear files, and all of a sudden you want to grab 20 programs at once, but you only have maybe 50 a week. You got a big peak, go back to a stable spot, and then again you pay as you go. Or this could be the Olympics, and at the end of the Olympics it all goes down to zero again. 
some of the examples. Here are a number of providers who are providing infrastructure as a service. That's the ability, like Amazon Web Service, like SHI, like Fujitsu, a number of GoGrid, um, to be able to basically configure your system and paper use CPU servers, basically raw building blocks. There's a number of them out there. You can check them out on the website, on their websites. If you start looking at sample cloud applications, this all started out for IT. And then the world's moving to software-based solutions, so why not use it for other applications? And this is a list of the different types of applications that are currently running. These are actually off the Amazon website, Amazon Web Services site of examples. And you can go by example by example by these different business units. And this is the example they use for media applications. You've got Second Life, which is a 3D simulation in the world environment. You've got Wowza on this side. You've got PBS in the cloud that's been there for a long time. And what you're going to see here is a mix of social network applications like um, Foursquare, my favorite one. I am going to go down here to the restaurant and find out I get a 15% off on my meal because I'm logging in. And the, you see the tweet recently, the Mars lander tweeted, and he says, I'm now the mayor of Mars. Anyway, <laughs> so for those of you who know Foursquare, that's what it's all about. Now, the reason you've seen this merger and it's happening, it's exciting, this is convergence at its best. But what's happening now is the average person who tweets, including me, has got about 250 followers on average. If you've got a TV program with a million people watching it today, and you can create some interactivity and something they want to tweet about, that million, there may be only 10% uh, of them, 100,000 of them are tweeting. They, did you see that? Did you see that outfit? Did you see that car? Wow, what a, what a cool ad. It's really funny. They got 250 followers. All of a sudden, I got an audience, not of a million, I've got 25 million followers that are coming in through tweet. It may come in and out and may only hit that one ad. That's what's driving this convergence of social uh, networking along with the multimedia, new media. Miranda they gave an excellent paper in a empty uh, uh, pitch I did the other day talking about the second screen and people sitting there with their iPads while they're watching TV or tweeting on their phones and what different demographics between male and female and all the rest of it. So that's what's happening in the world. So, I'm trying to crowd a one hour presentation to a half hour, so you've just now, you're world experts on cloud computing technology. What I'd like to do now is present a summary of a, of a paper that came out of some work that's been done by SEMPTI, some work that Globecom's done in analyzing it, and Globecom sponsored a, uh, the presentation, a longer version of this for PBS Tech Forum earlier this year. So what's happening in the broadcasting industry, there's a paradigm shift going on right now in looking at the use of cloud computing technologies. The fact is that the technology exists today to take the complete legacy broadcast workflow right through, including the last 19 point whatever megabits per second to the broadcast center, all the way from end to end in the cloud. And people say, oh my god, no, it's public, it's, I want to protect my content and all the rest of it. Public cloud options exist, but there's all the issues of content protection. We talked about people taking runaway ads and all the rest of it. So there are concerns. So along comes private cloud technology that makes this enabled for the first time. It's like having your own private direct-to-home satellite broadcast network. At the same time that this is going on, the industry is moving from more linear tape. And I think uh, uh, we had, a, again, I attended a empty seminar last year. <clears throat> where they were estimating that something like 40% of the world is converted from tape to file-based workflow. A lot of hybrid systems out there. The, mar the industry is changing, but they still have a long way to go. Then you have all these changes we just talked about for the IT industry. That all of a sudden, you've got pro private cloud capabilities that look like Amazon, that are able to drop in with new business models. And at the same time, guys like Cisco and Miranda have gone away from these rack and stack hardware pizza boxes and I love them because I'm an engineer and I used to build pizza boxes. They've gone to software, and guess what? You put it on a server, next thing you know, you virtualize the servers, the next thing you know, you can make it in the cloud. So that's what's happening right now, and it's exciting. At the same time, what's pulling all this is the customers. Uh, the uh, CTO from um, YouTube said something like 75% of all television and other media content will be delivered over the internet by the year 2020, and I think that's actually going to move forward. We're seeing, we're seeing RFPs today on the street where people are moving very aggressively. 
broadband connectivity is there. You guys know that. You're seeing it all the way through your cell phones and mobile devices. And the media industry itself is struggling because you've got new entrants. You go back three, four, five years ago, if you wanted to have a private uh, a specific um, TV show specific to your demographics or a unique group, a niche group, you had to go and get a satellite network. Globecom would be glad to build those for you. Guess what? Now you can go to New Lion, you can go to a number of cloud service providers, and you can be pumping that over the top and have your own TV show anywhere in the world. And you couldn't do that years ago. So it's a level playing field now. So if you look at the, the legacy business, there's still a lot of tape out there. It's expensive. And it used to be, though, it was cheaper to dupe a tape and run it across town than it was to wait for the two hours or so to transmit over a high bandwidth uh, uh, internet connection. That's not true anymore. You can deliver this stuff in a fraction of the time with somebody like Aspera, for example, as opposed to doing it all the old FTP, uh, TCP approaches. So that's the legacy approach. SEMTI and others will show you a diagram like this, where it's all gone to the various elements, all moving to file-based workflow. You saw I heard Viacom talking this morning about the need to capture live feeds to make video on demand assets, preserving Nielsen watermarking, putting in checkpoints at the segment and the program level so you can drop and insert ads downstream either in a cable TV traditional broadcast or in a um, TV anywhere or in an over the top solution. So this is where the world is going. Then along comes, so that is the world goes to file based workflow in general. Then, if you then analyze that and you say, what are, which of those functions could we put in the cloud easily? It turns out this list, the ingesting and transcoding, the whole issue of media asset management, which is about a $500 million a year business today in the cloud, the hosting for over the top delivery and then the direct lines into, um, into the CDNs, and we were talking about both linear and the content on demand type of, uh, of uh, delivery of over the top. Archival and disaster recovery becomes a natural when you're in this environment. All the issues of quality control and testing. And finally, also testing and simulation. We had a client, or I had a client years ago that had a 5,000 site radio network We're about to launch a new software a client for their traffic management delivery. We stress tested on 200 sites. They said, we're ready to go. And they said, oh, no, you're not. Stress tested on 5,000. We said, well, we're not going to buy 5,000 servers. How are we going to do that? We went to Amazon, put down the credit card, simulated the whole thing. We found some stress loading, and I think the bill was three or $4,000 after a week or two of testing. That's the kind of thing that's being used. And, and, and Silicon Valley development teams are being given credit card numbers. Go use the cloud for your development testing and simulation. So people say, that's the cloud. OK, I can do that. I, get, I got the idea. I'm going to ingest a file. I got to transcode it to some format. I'll go up into the cloud and send up a 50 megabit per second stream up there or a file. It takes me two hours to load it. They'll transcode it, bring it back, you know, whatever my bandwidth is. And they say, I've got, it's, it's tough for me. And I know bandwidth is getting cheaper. And if you're somebody like Viacom or Gopcom's got a huge connection right down onto the backbone, that's not a big issue. But for, say, a public broadcaster or a station group, that could be a little expensive. So that's the brute force approach. And this, most people have the objection to, do I really want to do that? In Jess, I've got all these different f stages in the workflow, and I've got my database. What's the advantage? Well, the answer is, don't do it that way. Put all of the workflow, oops, there we go. <laughs> Did I get it right? Is this slide? Yeah, I just want to make sure I am. So guess what? Most of the content's already coming to you digitally, user-generated content other different types of formats. Sure, you're getting tape still, but that in a private cloud configuration, that's fairly easy to ingest and digitize. Why not ingest and transcode? Once you got the data, keep it in the, in the cloud. Have all your workflow elements in here. Have thin clients. And now you're running off inexpensive workstations and managing your process in a cloud. Now, don't think necessarily public cloud. This could be a, a private cloud configuration unique to your organization or to a community of users, but it has a common feature. In a private cloud situation, for example, I can put a transcoding GPU processor in here, graphic processor unit accelerator for transcoding, that I wouldn't put in a public cloud. But in a broadcast application, I can do that because it's specific to this community or this group. 
And one of the SEMPTI authors talks about, and the advantage of this, this approach is we get hit with a disaster or a, um, a capability, or an overload, we can take the whole team down to Starbucks, get them a broadband connection, and we're still on air. Because it's robust, it's there, and we are basically thin clients down here. That's an oversimplification. We'll show you some examples a little later. So thin pipes are the trick to making this work. But once you're in the cloud, guess what? You are already in a native environment for over-the-top delivery, either to your own CDN, which is fairly, again, we've done some of this on our own. If you're, depending on if it's an enterprise type class where you're maybe 10,000 users, you build your own, your own uh, CDN here. Or guess what, you can push it out to a, another CDN, but guess what, they're tied to that network. They're already on the backbone. You have infinite bandwidth, you, it's a native um, environment for over-the-top delivery. So I'll make sure I'm on time here. So going one step further, there's my, my workflow in the cloud. I'm delivering here, but guess what? Bandwidth within this environment is free. I can transfer huge chunks of files back and forth quickly, easily, and free within this cloud activity because it's hardwired, it's a virtual, if you remember the diagram, it's a reconfigurable network. And guess what? Other clouds, that would be all, because you're by nature what that is, are connected through backbone, through high bandwidth, fiber connectivity, and low cost connectivity this way to other remote locations. You could have a European operation and a, uh, like over the global, uh, Globcom network, for example, and a North American one, backing up here over the top delivery there more efficiently than say here. So that's another way of thinking of the advantages of the cloud technology for this. So then we look at the, the um, once, I, once that content is in the cloud, we talked about this multi-platform delivery, you start looking at what is the issue around transcoding. I want to ingest maybe live content, encode in the, in, the, in, the, in the cloud, and then get it out. And again, we'll talk about adaptive bitrate uh, encoding in a little later today. This is a table that's a year old. We're working on a project. It was 26 codecs for, for that particular application. And the same uh, consultant I was working with at the time, uh, to just about a couple months ago, for a similar configuration, has 65 codecs. Viacom was here a few minutes ago. They talked about eight different levels, the HDS, the HLS, and going to the MPEG dash, going from, I think, uh, all the way up to three and a half megabits per second at 720p down to 200 kilobits per second. So what you're seeing here are the different formats. This point of all this is if you're in the cloud, this is, a, this is a, how many virtual machines do I need for how long and how much is this changing? We've got 265 coming out next year. MPEG Dash was on this list a year ago. So that's the advantage of being able to do it in the cloud. Once you're there, you've got these huge files. Archival is a natural add-on. It's holds disaster recovery. We can feed it right out to LTO, long-term uh, open. Tape formats, which is still the industry standard because of the volumes we're talking about. And again, because you can be geographically diverse, you can locate backups and, other, and combine with other LTO uh, capability geographically and otherwise uh, functionally within the same, uh, seen the same geographic region. Another advantage on archival, because memory is relatively cheap inside your cloud and because it's easily to duplicate, it's on demand, you suddenly have the Olympics going on right now you can create a low latency cache that is terabytes, petabytes, store it all in there. You have it for rapid access, it looks like it's very quick, and then only spool it off as you go. And from a disaster recovery perspective, it's all there. It's a natural archiving process, so that when you, you only pay for disaster recovery when you actually need it. Boom. So, in summary, the technologies are there to be able to use cloud computing technologies for end-to-end -end production workflow. At the same time, the industry should see this as a natural evolution, and you're hearing it from some of the, the uh, market leaders, uh, like we heard from Viacom this morning, and like we'll hear a little later from Cisco, and the, and the uh, guys from Miranda already talking about it. They're leading this area. So there's a couple, three papers if you get the uh, 
presentation, hard copy. You'll look them up. These are recent ones. Um, biased a little bit towards SEMPTI because they are doing some good work in this area. And you can find that. Yeah. Okay, any questions before we move into the panel? Yes, sir. What does the inside of the cloud look like? Very cloudy. <laughs> <laughs> Chance of meatballs. One of the most common things I have when I'm talking briefing to management teams, it's not doing stuff in the cloud. You remember going back 10, 15 years ago, we had the first DTH systems. How do we plug up this encoder, this subscriber management system? What bit rates do we do? How much bandwidth, VBR versus CBR? What are we going to do? What the set-top boxes? It was so crude, but we figured it all out. Guess what? It's, it is virtual. We, the, the guys call it a pane of, pane of glass, single pane of glass. I drag and drop my... My firewalls, my DMZs, my servers go in here. I can isolate LANs. It's all done on glass. You hit the button, boom, it's up and existing. And you know, two weeks later, you want to configure it, you change it. So the cloud is virtual. And when Rick uh, gets up a little later, we can ask that question to him. Okay. Good. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Is it directly apparent that this is going to save money for companies? I mean, why do this? The average loading, and the CA Technologies, a number of people have done the study on it. In my longer presentation, we could talk about it. The average servers utilize about 15 to 20% because of this issue of server creep and being able to isolate and be plug and play between them. So very inefficient. And that goes, multiplies in terms of cost for power and HVAC and all the rest of it, but also on maintenance. You, you know, the old days of, oh, the email server went down. They call the service guy at lunch. He runs, he replaces it, and away you go. Nowadays, on the maintenance side, they just drive a truck around once a month in these data centers. They've gone from one per 50 servers uh, as a statistic in a traditional rack and stack to one to 1,000 servers maintenance person. So you've got these cost advantages. And on top of that, when you do something like, we'll talk about the SHI model later, but any of the private cloud other options, you pay for what you use. So all of a sudden, you've got something like the Olympics. You don't go out and rush and buy truckloads of servers and get up and running and then wonder what they're doing later. You this use for what you use, and then it's gone away later. That's how Amazon got into it. They had peak loading at Christmas, and the rest of the year they had all their servers laying still. So somebody said, let's see if we can sell some bandwidth and some CPUs servers, and that's how it worked. So there are major, major price and cost advantages on this story. But I'm going to bring up some real experts here. Uh, Rich Place, who is a lead partner for cloud services at SHI Inc. Uh, Rich, you come up. <laughs> Brian Morris, who is the Global Director for Cisco Media and Entertainment. And also Ed Behan, who's our own VP of Enterprise Services for Globecom. Um, welcome, uh, gentlemen. So their bios, some of the bios are in the back. And I'll let them introduce themselves here in a moment. And um, what I had prepared was a little presentation for, for the, those of you who weren't going to be here through the first half. So I can skip through those a little a little quicker now. Um, just to set the tone for the panel, there are the three things that are driving this, the use of cloud technologies. What's happening in the, the market in terms of the, the move to IT, to IP and TV everywhere, all those the things, the mobile apps, the broadcast industry moving from hardware to software, and then the actual cloud computing industry providing all the tools to make this work. We talked about this, so I don't need to do it again. I emphasized private cloud and for a reason. And the reason for that is in the broadcast arena, we believe it's a private cloud application for all the reasons they're concerned about content and security. And so on that note, we'd like to introduce, introduce SHI. And uh, Rich, do you want to talk this, or shall I introduce it and let you have the question? But you, maybe you could introduce uh, SHI and, uh, and explain a little bit about who you guys are. Sure. And uh, why, what's, why the trend of private cloud and what you see? Okay, great, thank you. Um, so SHI is a uh, five billion privately held uh, company. Uh, it's been in business for 23 years. Uh, it started out um, reselling uh, software and hardware uh, to actually uh, large uh, enterprise accounts. Uh, IBM was uh, SHI's first customer. Uh, it wasn't actually until 2008 uh, that we moved into the SMB space, uh, and uh, that business will exit uh, 2012 in excess of a billion dollars. Obviously, um, that business was a natural transition for the company to move into both professional services and cloud services 
uh, in, in the marketplace. So that I'll say that traditional you know capex model of buying hardware and software and standing that up uh, in a data center. Uh, and the customers' um, uh, requests and requirements to move to this OpEx model, where you know I can now you know on demand use my um, uh, IT infrastructure on an as-needed basis, and so um, uh, you know our our existing customer base that we have, as they want to make that move, you know to cloud services. You know, from that traditional capex to opex model, you know, the intent there is is for SHI to be there for those customers to make that smooth transition because you know most customers aren't going to you know jump 100% into you know a cloud service offering uh, and then um, uh, will want to make that you know transition over time. The other advantage I think SHI had is uh, we've been profitable every quarter uh, since the inception of the company uh, and the growth uh, has been uh, organically. So uh, there is no long-term or short-term debt to the company and so uh, that really allowed SHI to be able to make the investment that one needs to make to be able to stand up a cloud service. Uh, data centers, infrastructure, uh, cloud operations, you know, team to run it and manage that, you know, for our customers. So very capital intensive uh, business, uh, but obviously with no long term or short term debt, uh, very uh, easy investment for SHI to be able to make uh, and, and offer to our customers on a worldwide basis. The, the other thing that we really looked at is, um, I'll, I'll say not being a first mover into the marketplace, allowed us to really assess the market and look at how can we differentiate in the market. And we really look at what we've done as a second generation cloud offering in the marketplace. Uh, and, and obviously the biggest concerns uh, most companies have today about moving to cloud uh, is all about uh, security. And so um, we, we do have a multi-tenant cloud offering. Uh, we don't call it public. Um, and so when you look at the Amazons and the Terramarks uh, and rack spaces of the world, um, they all have a public cloud offering where you can go up and swipe a credit card. Well, you know, clearly once you um, uh, do that, uh, you open yourself up to denial of service attacks. Uh, we actually onboard customers into our multi-tenant environment and then provide them access to our, our portal environment. Uh, and then we do um, uh, both uh, network encryption uh, as well as data encryption at rest uh, in the multi-tenant environment. And we have a third party company called Solutionary that monitors our external you know, cloud environment. And so that um, really you know, provides um, a, a very strong, I'll say, um, a security offering around multi-tenant. Uh, but then we hear from customers that say, well, you know, we can't go to a multi-tenant uh, offering or even a public cloud offering, um, either due to government regulations or security requirements that our customer ha uh, customers uh, or our internal IT organization or company has, and so it requires us to keep data you know, within the four walls of our premise. Um, and there we um, either provide customers a private cloud implementation where they run and manage the cloud themselves, or uh, we provide something we call managed private cloud, which we think is actually very unique in the marketplace today. Managed private cloud is where we put the hardware and software that provides the virtual machines on the customer's premise. Uh, we own it and manage it just like we do in uh, a multi-tenant environment. Uh, and so it really provides the both of best, uh, best, best of both public and private cloud where you get the price and you know, provisioning capability and, and management capability of a public cloud offering, but you get all of the security offerings you know, in, in a, um, uh, a private cloud implementation. So, um, uh, and, and then you, know, you start to be able to get into some very interesting, I'll say hybrid cloud implementations. So yep. just kind of a, a high level overview of, uh, of the company and, and the offerings that we have Super. here. What you see here are basically the building blocks these guys build, the dash numbers of the number of virtual machines. And again, think of this as either a remotely managed cloud or a hosted service, multi-tenant or single tenant. And then they, now you have, what are you going to run on it? So this is infrastructure as a service and provides a number of virtual machines, so much storage and capacity, and you pay per SIP. There's a standby charge, and then you pay per SIP. 
So this is uh, the remotely managed element of that. We can come back to this later if there are any questions on it. So then we talk a little bit about an application. You talked earlier about the nice little block diagrams with P1s and C1s. It was a generic discussion about file-based workflow. Cisco has a product line called Videoscape, which is a complete end-to-end -end, uh, solution, all the way from uh, ingest right through to customer delivery. You're going to talk about ABR and that end of it. And Brian, can you talk a little bit about what, what is Videoscape a little bit and why, why did you aim it at the cloud and how easy is it to do as a, as a cloud service? Thank you, Ron. So uh, Videoscape is a next generation video delivery platform. And what we've been trying to do is uh, evolve uh, video distribution from where it is today. And you ask, why did we go towards the cloud? We're trying to leverage the cloud, the network, multiple clients and multiple applications. What you have today for video distribution is very much uh, linear VOD services that are very much infrastructure built. Brian, you talked about pizza boxes and things <laughs> of that nature. Um, we still sell the pizza boxes. <laughs> I mean, ourselves, Motorola, uh, I saw some gentlemen from Tamburg, we sell about a billion dollars a year of pizza boxes. But they're very stagnant uh, pieces of infrastructure. A multinational content provider today typically will run uh, networks in the United States, in Asia, and in Europe. They'll spend in excess of $50 million to $75 million a year to deliver linear and VOD-based services. And um, talk about disaster recovery. They typically build two locations, two complete uh, redundant locations that are connected via fiber services. Very expensive, lots of people, lots of infrastructure, lots of parts. And that's what uh, today runs the majority of revenue streams that come from television services. But what are clients looking for in the future? They're looking for uh, TV anywhere, any kind of content, any place, anywhere, to any kind of device. I mean, I, I think a great example, I was down at Disney World with my parents, I know my parents, my, uh, my children and my, <laughs> my parents. Oops. <laughs> Whoa. Nice try. <laughs> nice try. <laughs> I, tried to, I tried to bring them along to pay the bills. But uh, we were down there, and uh, in the evenings, right, uh, my children were watching TV on the iPad. It was uh, sitcoms on YouTube they were watching, yeah. uh, movie content, or movies we had downloaded. Only the old man was sitting there watching TV in a linear broadcast format. Mm -hmm. And on the way back you know, to Atlanta, again, downloaded videos, whatever they wanted was downloaded on iPads. And it takes exactly three movies to uh, drive from Disney World to uh, Atlanta. <laughs> did you buy your dad an iPad, Brian? <laughs> I did buy my dad okay. an iPad. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the point behind it, all of this is uh, it, there, the infrastructure of today's linear delivery is going away and content providers and service providers are trying to figure out how do they manage and how do they provide that experience to the end users any video anytime anywhere any device mm -hmm. and uh, it is flexible this can be built up in small portions large portions what cisco is trying to do with videoscape is build a complete infrastructure end-to-end -end solution we'll sell the pieces the parts and you know you can build it as needed and that's what most of the content guys our providers and owners are trying to figure out how do we uh, evolve our traditional business models to the future models. Well, we saw it scale it's scalable as well. I mean, we and it's it's all you've working on a virtualized platform. We saw your demo system is on a on a server farm this big, and then and a recent proposal that was three racks wide for That's heavier right. loading, uh, and it is all per pay per sip if you put it on a cloud type infrastructure such as the one that That's SHI right. is doing. Yep. Cool. So that's just a little overview. It's not intended to be a sales pitch, but it's a real life application of what we've been talking about. And here's a simplified diagram of what we just talked about. I hadn't anticipated the Viacom discussion, but you heard them talking about grabbing live streams and making VOD out of it and having all the issues of having to put it out to different devices. This is the kind of system you would use for that kind of an application, both VOD and streaming. And finally, um, I'd like to introduce Ed uh, Behan. Ed is the VP of our enterprise products uh, service business. And we have a product called Tempo uh, 2.0 now. And he has direct experience in how they use the internet. Uh, they, sorry, the cloud services 
could you explain how you did that and what the advantages were of using cloud services to get to market and what the kind of hurdles you had to go after them? Sure. Well, in the enterprise space, it's, um, the, the enterprise world is, is extremely pragmatic and um, almost all decisions are, are based on financials. And um, so companies have large investments in their IT infrastructure and they're going to keep leveraging those as long as they can. But where, where there's opportunities for new, for new services, the economics drives them to the cloud. So, um, so the way we viewed it was we, we would turn and we looked towards media services, which are relatively new inside corporations in a, in a broadcast sense. And we would, we would try to focus our, our oper our, all of our efforts on, the, on that piece of the cloud. So um, what you can see what we've done here is instead of having to have a, an entire um, media head end per se, to do live, live events and streaming, we can set them up just with an encoder and then manage a core in the cloud, um, whether it's initially at our facility here or over time moving out through uh, tier one providers and be able to offer it, offer it this way. Where inside that cloud, we're able to do content delivery, we're able to um, stream media, do transcoding engines, take all of those pieces, put them together. So um, I really think the, the, the drivers for what we're doing right now is um, mobility and I would say uh, collaboration. And it's not just that we think of broadcast media and entertainment applications being our traditional broadcasters, but almost every large corporation today in their communication strategy, their, their training, the interactive training, their marketing campaigns, tying into social network, marketing along with all the traditional stuff, you know, all of that stuff is happening in real time. And it's video and multimedia rich intensive. And it, it cries for a media asset management uh, solution so you can find the content, piece it together, reuse it, and take advantages of the, the kinds of things. And we heard Viacom talking earlier about having these silos of IT versus their digital media guys versus their uh, broadcast center not actually talking to each other. And when they did, they got in tremendous synergies. You start thinking about this again in a file-based workflow, live content from town hall, uh, and tie that all into cloud services. So guess what? You have a town hall once a month and it's really hot. You're only going to pay for that that SIP where you got 10,000 customers out there pulling on their iPads, you're paying for use and then it goes away. Yeah. Yeah. Ron, I would add that on, uh, we're finding that with most major content providers and broadcasters now, there were silos of broadcast engineers and IT engineers that are all being brought under one roof. Yeah. So that it's happening real time and it's happening today. One of the, se the empty sessions I attended uh, last year, they said the toughest thing they had culture was get the IT guys and the broadcast engineers together. You know, it's a traditionally not been an easy culture switch and so it's the way it's been going. So we have a little time for questions. Um, oh yeah. I'd like to actually address one of the questions that was asked earlier and, and that was, you know, is, is there really cost savings in the cloud? And, and so, you know, my answer to that would be, how many people here leave their lights on all the time? <laughs> Anybody here? Well, why don't you leave your lights on all the time? Because it saves you money. When you look at electricity, electricity today is a cloud service. You turn it on when you need it, and you turn it off when you don't need it, and you don't pay anything when you don't need it. You don't own your own generator today to power electricity for your business or your home because a centralized or cloud service from the electric company saves you money. And, and that's really the benefit of, of cloud services from an IT perspective. Um, when you look at the economics um, where you can now centralize things, you know, and historically um, uh, when, you, you, when you look at, I'll say, human culture, it is to centralize things when you can get the cost out of it. You know, we've done it with farming, where you've got large centralized farming. We, we don't you know, farm ourselves to, to, to uh, feed ourselves. Same thing with electricity. We centralize electricity, um, uh, again, to save money, and you don't have the cost of maintaining and, and doing that yourself. And obviously now from an IT standpoint, we're seeing where economically it makes sense to save money to be able to centralize those IT services you don't have to worry about, I'll say, the, the, you know, the care and feeding of the, the plumbing 
um, on a day-to-day -day basis and it allows the IT organization now to move up the value chain and look at the applications and the business and how do I differentiate the company um, in the marketplace. There's only really two things you can do. It's either generate new revenue streams or save a company money. And so now how do I enter a new market in Asia Pac? How do I um, you, you know, save you know, the company you know, money by doing something different or differentiated from our, com our competitors in the marketplace? That's the benefit of, of cloud services to the IT organization. Yeah. If I could add to that. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. If I could add to that, Rich, it goes back to that, that, uh, that number I talked about with content providers on a global basis. You know, think about that 50 to 75 million a year just to distribute linear and VOD content. Mm -hmm. That is being looked at by the engineers, but it's being looked at by the CFOs. That's yearly operating expenses just to distribute to traditional markets. Mm -hmm. Those markets are changing, and they're uh, going to a you know, real time, whatever you want, whatever kind of content to any kind of device. They're mm -hmm. looking at those operating expenses in yeah. a heavy way. I mean, cut 10 million or 15 million out of that operating yep. expense every year. That's, that, a, that's, that's a big on the, deal. That's on the expense side. You look at Nielsen, and Nielsen's claim something like $80 billion a year of advertising is based on those Nielsen ratings. Yeah. And you come along with something like the C3 window where you got the VOD and you're trying to count the users if they're, they're watching it three days later, that counts as a hit, and trying to drive that content anywhere that advertising model and trying to grab those eyeballs because I'm watching my iPad, not not my your dad, but your kid, right. you know, and the kid is, counts as a separate eyeball and maybe it's another for that particular app uh, program that they're watching. Exactly. Yeah. Tom, yeah, but, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. I understand that the centralized concept and, and the fact is that, that you can ramp up because that capacity is there. Not everybody's using it all at the same time. It's the private model that kind of bothers me because it looks like just. You've got a rack there, now I've got to worry about the maintenance of it. I don't have the capability to ramp up. I, I don't understand the benefit of it. Well, you're a real straight man for this guy. So, so, so great, great question. So, um, you know, when we deploy a managed private cloud solution where we actually put the virtual machines on the customer's premise in their data center, um, we own it, we manage it. Um, we provide all the services on that. So it is really a cloud appliance that goes into customers' uh, facilities. How do I ramp up? So um, uh, there's a couple of ways that you can actually ramp up. We actually provide those in three different configurations, 100 virtual CPUs, 400 virtual CPUs, and 2,000 virtual CPUs. There's your diagram behind you, so Rich. You, you get into um, a platform um, that provides you growth uh, to be able to expand. And then um, you have the ability to either upgrade a V100 to a V400, or you can add you know, multiple um, V cores or MPCs, managed private clouds, to what you already have today. And so it really provides you the flexibility to expand um, that, that makes sense for your business. Well, that's the beauty of, of, of cloud. You only pay for what you use. Mm -hmm. And so just like in a multi-tenant environment where you pay for what you use, same thing in the managed private cloud environment. The only difference that we do is we have a, a minimum charge because now you have um, hardware and software dedicated for your use. So you're paying, um, I'll say for about 30% usage um, of that platform. So what we will look at is, is what your initial usage is and say, geez, you want to get into a platform that, you know, that 30% um, covers, because typically, you know, you don't go to zero in, in, in a cloud type of environment. There'll all be some, you know, virtual machines that are running. So it's really, it's a, it's a great way um, for a company to get started with cloud at a very low cost. And I'll give you an example. The V100 that we have, the 100 virtual CPUs, um, uh, the monthly uh, start price on that is $6,000 a month. With that model, pure private, I mean, that if somebody has a large resource on the premises, maybe because they just feel comfortable with the box to pick, uh, uh, wouldn't you roll in apps from the outside and say, well, you know, if you get this part of the machine, we are the premises, but we're using another 40 or 50 percent outside connecting to the outside. No, that's you make it pure private. Just it, it, right? it, is, it is a cloud yeah. appliance dedicated to your, your use. Uh, nobody else has access to it. It's on your premise. Um, it's connected to your network. Um, and you provision it just like you would a public cloud, but it's on your premise, you know, dedicated for your use. So nobody else has access to it. 
um, uh, we we run and manage and and we'll build you know the usage on that, but you know we can't see what you're doing with it or uh, you know from security standpoint have any access. We'll to the the ramp up and to bring another box in. You know? But next week I need to double my capacity. Boom, yes. or, or you do or you do you do an upgrade from a V100 to a V400, so and you can very easily upgrade you know an existing yep. machine that's on premise. SHI was the platinum sponsor for this year's Cloud Expo, and when you gave your keynote address, one of the or Henry did, yep. one of your competitors said, yeah, but how does how do you pay for it? And you said, we've just decided we're going to price it at 30% capacity. You get a V-Core 2000, you pay for 600 virtual machines as a steady state, but if all of a sudden you got to use up all 2,000 machines, you pay for the week or so, and it goes back, right. and that's too bad, and they're unique in that business model. Right. Right, wow. uh, and that was the advantage, again, we had yeah. being able to come in with a second generation cloud offering. And that's why I invited Rich to speak here because that's a very special offering within the broadcast community because they do have this steady state. All of a sudden you do get 15 programs at once you want to convert to VOD, but you have this average of 50 a week. And so you peak it, comb back down again. You don't have to size it for that, whatever that 20 or 50 grabs in worst case condition. And yeah. so that's the advantage, and that's why we brought him out here for this discussion. I, I, well, I, Sorry. I'd also want to, I'd like to add, go back to the cost associated with traditional distribution, right? I mean, oh, yeah. people are tying up satellite capacity at extremely hard, high dollar content in comparison to yep. what's done in a cloud-based environment. Yep. You have to look at today versus tomorrow. What he said was you could get the capacity for 100 virtual machines in your facility for $6,000 a month standby charge. And then when you peak up to, you want to talk about what it costs for 100? If you peak, well, it's it, per it, use. It, yeah. yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, um, depending upon the size of your virtual machines, you know, it, it varies in charge, just like you would in, in, in our multi-tenant, you know, cloud environment or, you know, another cloud, you know, service provider in the marketplace. Yeah. Question. I had a question about applications. Uh, one of the things that we see, a lot of application costs with various vendors, for media asset management, for operating systems, for you know different types of requirements. How does that work out within a cloud environment? That you, you're, you're talking machines, machines, but then again, you've got to put something in the machines, and sure. then you've got to be able to uh, sure. utilize so, that. So obviously, we, we have a whole uh, SaaS provider program, and so everything from you know the OS you know, is available to, um, um, you know, other third-party applications. The managed private cloud uh, solution is, I'll say, very similar to having a, you know, virtual machine environment that you own on your own premise. And so you can bring your own applications into that environment. So you probably have licenses you already have today um, that you're paying on and maybe, you know, a two or three year commit, you know, on that license. And so you treat this, you know, just like you would, you know, equipment that you own because yeah. it's on, on your premise in your data center. There's two elements of that. There's the basic infrastructure that, that uh, Rich and would be providing as the infrastructure as a service. Then you talked about the platform as a service, which would be the videoscape. And that's a licensing on top of that, which depends on the number of streams. You want to... This is what this diagram is all about. Number of streams, clients, what type yeah. of applications. I mean, it's, you build it up as needed or as what you're trying to acquire. Yeah. But and you can automate the workflow. I saw Peter configure workflow for ingest here, transcode there, go out here, comes back, go, go to this family of mobile devices, don't go there, and you automate that. And it stays relatively static, and then all of a sudden you get something like this example. Oh, we got to get this this thing done in ten thousand copies for Netflix, in different languages and formats. You set up that workflow, let it run, and automate, and away you go. So that's the that next level above, and how you license that, and that's all evolving, I guess, as we go. Yeah, I mean, not to advertise it, but Peter, part of our group, is able to demonstrate these capabilities mm -hmm. at any time, virtually or on site. Good. Any questions? Any more questions? How are we doing for time, Paul? Are you? Two minutes. I, I just another question on application. This is We're in this debate now about you know, the, the network. How do you migrate to the cloud? You know, and that, uh, you buy an application day, you get a seek license, you know, and it sits there, like you said, the machines, and all night long, no one's using it, all right? And it makes the application guys happy because they sell a ton of copies and they don't get used. Now you move it into a cloud environment, especially if the application is provided as part of the cloud. 
that application maker is saying, well, hey, I'm not going to sell it now just on a seat license because you're sharing it among 50 different user communities and it's being used 24 hours a day. Now they want a time impact. Is that something that you're seeing that some of the higher end customized application makers in the broadcast space are changing your model for licensing their software? Well, there's two elements to that cost model. If you, we put it together, if we were providing that as a service, there'd be, if we did the worst case hardware infrastructure, we would have a flat cost over the life of the service level agreement. If we go with a cloud version, it goes with a low level and then peaks up as your demand goes up. So there's that element of the costing and how you price it. The other element is how do you license the actual application, the platform as a service? And I'll hand over to Brian to answer that question. And it's, it, I mean, it's case by case basis right yeah. now. I mean, there's not a clear answer to it. Yeah. So if you use, you know, company XYZ software, and you say now we want to put you in the cloud environment, you know, they might be resistant, right? They might say we don't want to license. Well, Miranda's back there. They make all their software is, is uh, all virtualized now, and uh, most of it could be in a cloud environment. I put you on the spot there, uh, Peter. <laughs> That's why you need a managed service provider, like a Globecom, to look at for that physical element. <laughs> you, you set me up beautifully to manage that physical maintenance issue. No, 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 no. But it's, but it's a very good point. You need a physical managed service provider to manage the physical elements of that. But you need the remote part of that, which is we talk about on this diagram, which is the updates on the operating systems, the servers, the, the uh, metrics, and the, the, all of the versions that go along in that and the maintenance of it. That's what this value add is, what's called the cloud management platform on the SHI, as an example. Yeah, not we, trying to sell yeah, for your stuff. We, and we see a variety of different models, honestly. And it really varies you know, company by company. We've had you know, some companies come to us and say, hey, we don't want to do IT at all anymore. We just want to go you know, completely into your multi-tenant cloud. You know, we want nothing to do with it. We see others, you know, they'll stand up a, 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 a managed private cloud within their facility or colo they may be using right now today. And they want you know, DR or you know, backup services to our multi-tenant environment. We see you know, other companies, they'll take two MPCs um, and they'll use them, you know, as you know, failover, you know, for, for each other. I mean, the, the models, you know, have really, you know, varied, you know, completely on a, on a company by company basis. So it's been, it's actually been interesting. Wow, I think we've run out of time. It's been an exciting panel. It's uh, I want you to go away. Remember, it's not just doing stuff in the cloud. You're seeing history evolve. You're seeing the applications evolve, and uh, hopefully, we'll have another update for you next year's tech forum. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you.